Hello again to everybody who joined um, late and welcome to the second transnational access visit pitch. We'll begin today with a short um, overview of what the access visits are, um, why participate and how to apply for them. Then we have presentations of three of our host institutions and the data sets and studies you can access from them. And we, we will leave the last 20 minutes or so for your questions. Um, I would like to underline um, that this is the second pitch. We already had a webinar last week where we um, discussed University College Dublin, European Center and IPSOS and the materials from that webinar will be available very shortly, possibly even today on the Coordinate website. And with that, I'd like to give over to um, Catherine Jordan um, to take us through the transnational access visits. Thank you very much, Anna. I'm delighted to be here and delighted to get the opportunity to talk to you all about the transnational access visits. And as Anna said, I am the transnational access visits coordinator. Um, and so I'm a member of a team in UCD who are responsible for leading and organizing the transnational access visits. So I'd be your first port of call um, if you have any questions about the transnational access visits. Um, so the aim of the transnational access visits is to give researchers working in Europe, working in the area of child and youth wellbeing, the opportunity to visit and gain access to international birth cohort data, panel and cross-sectional service data that are residing in the participating countries, and those will be listed later in this presentation. Now, a lot of these data sets that we do, that we have available, that we have linked in with as part of the transnational access visits program are available virtually, but as you may be already aware, it can be often really complex um, gaining access to this data and understanding the technicalities associated with the data and the nuances associated with that data. So the purpose of the transnational access visits is to help provide guidance and support to researchers as they navigate these data sets um, and essentially provide you with access to data and personnel in those institutions so they can guide you through those data sets. Um, so the program itself um, uh, runs for a period, you're allowed to go on visits for a period of five to 15 working days. The minimum you're allowed to take is five working days and the maximum is 15 working days. Now these days can be split, split over a number of weeks, um, but it's really important that the budget doesn't exceed um, the 1,250 allowance that is allowed per week to cover, and this is to cover travel accommodation and subsistence during their visit. The programme is open to academic researchers, starting from PhD researchers right up to full professors, as well as policy practitioners and other researchers and analysts working in Europe, uh, EU countries and associated states. And a list of these associated states is actually in the policy document on the Coordinate Transnational Access Visits website. So if you're not sure if your country is listed, um, have a look at the policy document and we list all the associated countries there. The calls for applications are issued twice a year. The first call is live currently and the deadline for that application for the first call is the 25th of February. Um, the call that's currently going out now covers a one year period from April 2022 to April 2023. So these are just a list of the data sets that we have that we are linking with and the host institutions um, that have these associated data sets. Um, so throughout these webinars, you will hear from the various institutions who will detail and give detailed information about their various data sets. So these are the list of host institutions and data sets that you can apply to visit as part of the Transnational Access Visits Program. Um, so the eligibility criteria, um, and just really to reiterate what I'm talking about here is all also on the coordinate website under Transnational Access Visits. So to be eligible to apply for transnational access visits, you must have research or so the subject of your research proposal must be related to child and youth research. Um, and it's a really, really broad area. We're not being very specific in that, just the general area of child and youth research. You must work in an EU country or associated country other than the country where the access visit will take place. So if you're living in the UK and you want to apply to an institution within the UK, then you're not allowed to apply to that institution within the same region. 
You must have a contract or affiliation with a recognized academic or public institution, a not-for-profit organization or a registered company in an EU member state, which covers the duration of your visit. So you need to have an aff affiliation with this type of institution. Um, while the majority of our transnational access visits will be allocated to um, people living in the UK, in, sorry, not in the UK, in the EU or associated country, um, we do have an allowance of about 20% um, of total uh, access visits to non-EU countries. Um, PhD students are eligible apply, to apply, but you will require um, your PhD supervisor's uh, permission to apply and masters or bachelor students are not eligible to apply. So the starting point at which people can apply is from PhD students onwards. And no one applying can be uh, directly part of the consortium and um, the coordinate consortium. So any project members can't apply. Um, so this is the information about the application form. So the application form and the link to the application form is on the coordinate website. It's an online form, so it'll bring you through the various steps and submit that all online. Um, in part one of the application form, we're asking for basic information about the project, the host institution you wish to apply, and the data set you wish to access, as well as the applicant's details. In part two, we're looking in terms of the scientific and technical objectives of the project that you're um, proposing. So what is the base, what are the general objectives, context and rationale for the project that you're compose, uh, proposing? Um, and to describe really the innovative nature of your project, including where potentially it could go on to inform policy, which we're very interested in. In part three, we're really kind of interested in the quality of the methodology and implementation. So here, what we're interested in is the proposed method, work plan and schedule for your project. Um, and why you are cho choosing this proposed institution uh, and our data set that you have chosen. Um, also, we're asking as well to provide an alternative institution that you would also be interested in, as well as the data visit that you would like to go. Um, we're asking as well for while you're at that host institution, is there any particular type of equipment or material you wish to access? So, for instance, do you need an SPSS license? Is there something that you need um, in order to access that data set or work on that data set? Um, describe any potential risks or contingencies that might occur during the project and how you go about resolving or mitigating those risks. And then finally, what outcome you would like from your visit? Would you like to collaborate with key personnel within that institution? Would you like to have, have gained expertise in data um, specific to that data set? Then we're asking for a little bit more information about you as, as the candidate. Um, we're asking to write a really short bio, um, 150 words about your background, um, listing three recent publications or conference presentations in the past three years. And this is just part five is just for PhD students. This is what we want to make sure that your PhD supervisor fully supports your application. So we're asking for your PhD um, supervisor's name and also confirming that they support your application to take part in this visit if you are awarded the visit. Um, so then when we receive your application, the selection procedure I'm going to chat through now. Um, so the selection panel um, um, reviews all applications that come in and it comp compromises, comprises of uh, members of the transnational access team here in UCD, as well as representatives from the host institutions to which you're applying and independent represent representatives drawn from the coordinate international advisory board and other independent sources. So it's a combination of these three elements um, sit on the se um, selection panel. Selection panel will review and score each application and average scores across all reviewers will then be calculated. Um, and there's four outcomes um, that could, uh, could result from your application. Your fund is approved, not approved. A more suitable institution or data set is identified by a panel on the application, uh, on the selection panel. Or there's a request to resubmit to the next call. And we plan to notify all applicants approximately one month after you submitted your application after the closing date um, of the outcome of their application. So it should hopefully be a one month turnaround from the closing um, date of the call. Um, so these are the criteria we're looking for when we're actually reviewing the applications. First of all, we're really interested in the innovative nature of the project and the relevance to the coordinate aims, the aims of the coordinate project. Um, 
for example, you know, is it research on child well-being? And we there is details about the aims and objectives of coordinate on the coordinate website. So I would strongly recommend that when you're preparing your application that you do take a good look at the policy document and the more information that's on the transnational access visits. We're interested in implementation and move through app applications as well as innovation, but also implementation. So here what we're interested in is the quality, effectiveness and feasibility of the visit and the proposed work. Another factor we consider when we're reviewing applications is the scientific impact that project could have. Um, how could it advance our understanding or our knowledge in the field? Um, what are the relevance of the project to the European scientific community, community other research disciplines? And again, has it any um, capacity to inform policy? The academic excellence of the applicant. So here we'll be really looking at your bio um, and your most recent publications or scientific presentations. And here we're really interested in the overall academic merit of the applicant. And priority will be given to early career researchers, those from low GDP countries and countries with limited experience of longitudinal data collection and gender. Um, um, those countries will be prioritized. Um, so before your visit, what's going to happen? Um, so before your visit, if your application is successful, you liaise directly with the host institution that you've chosen um, to arrange your visit. And this comes in terms of timing, the dates that work for the host institution as well as yourself, how to go about reimbursement um, and data access agreements. Um, during the visit, um, you'll be provided with access to an office or a computer and you will have regular meetings with staff involved in that host institution. And here what's really important is if you've identified those key collaborators that you would like to work with, this is an opportunity to touch base um, and physically meet them. A timesheet should be maintained throughout your visit um, as well when you're completing your visit and your and your, your working days at the institution you're visiting. After the visit, you must submit original receipts to the host institution within 60 working days and submit a short report about your visit, write a short blog summarizing their, your visit, which will post on the coordinate website and complete an online survey to track your outputs that results from this visit. Um, so there's four key tasks you'll have to do after your visit, um, but the transnational access team will be working with you along uh, during this time. And so we will give you reminders about your upcoming tasks that you have to complete. Um, so this is really the steps involved in how to go about applying for a transnational visit. I talked about the eligibility criteria earlier, and just to really reiterate that on the coordinate website and the transnational access visit page, we go into detail about the eligibility, uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria, and the policy document in particular contains really key information that will really support you um, and give you good hints and tips and advice as you're completing the application form. As I said, the application form is entirely online. So you'll do this um, entirely online through the coordinate website. And there is a, a, a portal within the application form where you submit your CV. Uh, as I said, for more information about the coordinate project, to read the policy document um, or information about the criteria, eligibility and selection criteria, please do visit the coordinate website um, where you'll find out more information. As I said, I am the, T, the transnational access visit coordinator for any any queries at all please do reach out to me my email address is there um, and if there's any technical problems and um, you can email me or contact the help desk through the website so that's it all from me best of luck with the applications and please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any questions thank you very much catherine for this overview we'll begin now with the uh, host institution beach Pitches and the first up is uh, Cara Brooker from the University of Essex. Thank you again for um, coming to this talk. And I, as um, Anna said, I'm going to be talking about the University of Essex and specifically the department that I'm in, the Institute for Social and Economic Research. So this is a photo just of the uh, Colchester uh, Castle. So if you do come to Colchester, this is one of the sites that you can visit. And the University of Essex was established in 1964. It's currently one of the top 30 UK universities, according to the Complete University Guide 2022. 
Um, in the REF 2014, so the Research Excellence Framework, um, Essex was ranked in the top 20 for research excellence in the UK and top five for social science research excellence. We have three campuses. The one pictured here is the Colchester campus, so the main campus, and then we have two satellite campuses, one in Loughton and one in Southland. And again, as I said, I'm going to be talking about the Institute for Social and Economic Research, ICER. And ICER is home to three major um, centers, the ESRC Research Center on Microsocial Change, um, MISOC, the Center for Microsimulation and Policy Analysis, SEMPA, and we are also home to Euromod, although most of that has now been moved to the EU, we do have um, it was housed at um, Essex for, or ICER for a long time, and we do still do have strong links with Euromon. So ICER was established in 1998 to house the British Household Panel Survey. Um, and it's now internationally renowned for our survey methodology and survey production, our economic, social, and health research, and our micro simulation, our uh, tax and benefit modeling. Um, that we do. We have over 80 staff and 27 PhD students and we cover a wide range of disciplines. So we have economists and sociologists, demographers, epidemiologists, biologists, social statisticians, survey methodologists, and public health experts. And the two main data sets, I know that on the list there was more than two, but I'm going to talk about the two main data sets, the real big draws of ICER, are Understanding Society, the UK Household Longitudinal Study, and the British Household Panel Survey, BHPS, which I have briefly mentioned earlier. So the British Household Panel Survey was a survey that ran from 1991 to 2009. And in this survey, we um, interviewed all adults age 16 and over annually. And we started with a sample of just over 10,000 adults in 5,500 households. And by wave 18, there are over 32,000 um, individuals in um, just under 22,000 households that had ever participated across the 18 years. Um, BHPS started as a strictly British, hence the Britain um, sample, um, but we did add um, Northern Ireland in 2001 to make it a UK-wide sample. Um, additionally, there are additional country samples to increase representativeness from Scotland and Wales in 1999. Um, Coming to what makes this interesting for the coordinate project, in way four, there is a young person survey, the British Youth Panel, that was added to BHPS. And in that um, survey, young people aged 11 to 15 were also interviewed annually. So the um, children of those people, that, of the adults that we were already interviewing, were now included. Um, over the 14 waves that we had the British Youth Panel, over 5,000 young people participated. And in wave four, there were about 770 young people that participated. Um, one of the interesting things is that once the young people turned 16, they were invited to become part of the panel, the adult panel. So you do have some um, young people who then became adults and are still in the study. So Understanding Society, or UKHLS, is the successor to the BHPS. We began collecting data for that um, from around 60,000 individuals and over 32,000 households in 2009. Um, there are currently 11 ways of data available freely through the UK Data Service. And um, Understanding Society has four, four main samples, all slightly with slightly different um, sampling schemes. We've got the general population sample. We have an ethnic minority boost sample. We have the BHPS, which um, in wave two, um, over 8,000 individuals from the BHPS were invited to take part in Understanding Society. I believe over 6,000 of them have participated in um, since uh, wave two. Um, and then we have the innovation panel, which is our method methodological panel. 
So that's a kind of an individual panel where we can do lots of um, interesting experiments methodologically. We've also had a um, ethnic and immigrant minority boost, um, ethnic minority and immigrant boost um, that came into the sample in um, wave six. And then there are also plans of adding additional um, sample members um, in wave, I believe, 14, 13. Um, and that will also allow the sample to become, again, more representative of the population, the UK, current UK population. Um, and from wave one, we have included a youth panel. Um, unlike, we've added a year onto our youth panel, so where BHPS was 11 to 15, our current youth panel is 10 to 15. And at wave 10, um, almost 14,000 young people have participated um, in any one wave, um, and there were uh, just under 4,500 young people that participated in wave one. And again, um, when they reach the age of 16, they are invited to join the main sample. So I'm just now going to briefly go through some of the data that we have, um, some of the child data, and then some of the questions that we ask the young people. So for child data, um, most of this, or all of this data comes from parents. So we have information about child care. For any child within the household age three, eight, uh, uh, sorry, three, five, and eight, we ask their parents about their child development. For any children in the household age 10, we ask about the parenting styles from the parent. And then we ask um, parents about their relationships with the child. So parent-child relationships for any child age zero to 15. Um, and then we also ask about child maintenance. So whether they receive child maintenance or whether they pay child maintenance, how much, um, uh, et cetera. And for the young people, so those aged 11 to 15, and most of this is also, um, it, most the, the questions that I'm gonna talk about here are mostly from um, understanding society, but you do have a lot of the same questions in the BHPS. So we ask about leisure time, we ask about screen use, non-school activities, um, family relationships and activities. So how often do they eat meals with them? Do they have chores? Um, we ask about school and home bullying, um, their relationships with friends, whether they have um, partners, um, their identity, so what they consider their religion to be or their ethnicity to be. We ask some health and well-being questions, so the SDQ is asked every other year. We also ask life satisfaction every year. Um, since wave six, I believe, we've asked about disability. Um, we ask about health-related behaviors, so these include um, things like um, uh, food, uh, different types of food consumption, so um, junk food and some healthy food. We also, also ask about smoking and drinking. Um, we ask if they care for any members of their family. Uh, risky behaviors such as binge drinking, drug taking behavior, um, education, so what their aspirations are, whether they are truant, uh, any environmental behaviors that they follow, or what their attitudes towards the environment are, and what their future intentions might be. So future intentions versus um, as it is about careers, marriage, education, leaving the home, etc. Um, understanding society is linked to a number of databases here. I just give you the educational databases that they're linked to. So they're linked to the national pupil databases in England and Wales, the early year census for England, the individualized learner records, um, the Northern Ireland educational data, as well as the Scottish educational data and the HESA data, which is the higher educational um, education data that's available. Um, in the UK. So for further information, you can go to our website um, at the top, the link. There's the long-term content plan, which shows you what has been collected for um, the, uh, the main survey as well as the youth survey. 
um, up through, I think they have up through um, plans for wave, the wave 14. So you can see what's been collected from wave one to wave 14, what years they're collected in, um, and also information about how to access the data is through this link through the data service. So briefly, what does Essex and ICER offer you? So if you choose to come to Essex or ICER, we do have training and support for using Understand the Youth Society. So we have training courses that run in March, May, and November of each year. These are um, some virtual, some face-to-face. Um, -face, so you have to look and see on the website which ones will be which. But we do have these courses that run. There are oppor uh, opportunities for collaboration. You're able to present and attend departmental seminars as well as research group meetings. And Essex has two um, fairly big, well-known annual summer schools. So there's the Social Science Data Analysis Summer School, and there's the Analytics Data Science and Decision-Making Summer School. And these tend to run uh, late June through early August. So um, you can find more information about those on the um, Essex Summer School website, but those are also two um, events that are going on in the summer that you might be able to attend if you come. So you can contact me. Also, Peter Lin is part of the Coordinate Project um, if you have any questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kara. Um, we'll go right on to, um, to the next presentation by Jean-Louis Lanoé from the French National Institute for Demographic Studies. <clears throat> Hello, um, my name is uh, Jean-Louis Lanoé. Um, I'm a researcher in health economics and I'm also a first hour member of the health court since I coordinated the social sciences <clears throat> for the first wave, the five first waves of the cohort. Just uh, before going to the slides, uh, just say a few words about the, this presentation of the health call. Um, health is an acronym for Etude Longitudinal Française depuis l'enfance, which means uh, French Longitudinal Study from childhood in France. The ELF uh, team is a joint uh, unit between INED and INSERM. INSERM is National Institute for Health and Medical Research. And the location of the ELF team is on the campus of INED, in the INED premises, in fact. Um, the team is in charge of uh, all the scientific and uh, organizational aspects of, the, of running the cohort. And uh, of course, uh, this is in the team will uh, welcome uh, the, the ones among you that would like to join us to work on the health data. The current director of uh, Health, the health team is uh, an epidemiologist from INSERM, it's Maria Aline Charles, and the deputy uh, director, Xavier Thierry, is a demographer from INED. Um, so let's go to the first uh, slide, if I can. which is a slide about what INED is, a French research institute dedicated to population sciences. INED exists since 1945 with missions to study populations in, in all major aspects, training research and true research promoting research in demography, informing the public about demographic issues. This INED, in fact, uh, put together researchers in a wide range of disciplines, uh, mainly in social sciences, 
sociology, economics, history, geography, anthropology, but also in more in harder science, if I can say it so, genetics, epidemiology, mathematics, statistics. INED is organized in 10 research units in one joint service unit, which is ELF, in, in fact. More than 50 full researchers, 45 associate researchers, almost 50 PhD students and 17 postdocs, and of course, 10 research support services, support services. One one thing which is original with uh, INED is that the only French research institution to have its own investigation department. And uh, INED, in fact, produces a lot of uh, data on things that, uh, let's say, uh, public statistics generally don't treat very profoundly. And uh, of course, this uh, investigation department of uh, INED is very helpful with us and some of the members are working with us. So coming to INED location, INED is located on the campus Condorcet campus, which is in the north suburbs of Paris, there's just one subway station out of Paris, and in a two minute, 12 minutes somewhere ride, you are in Montmartre, which is very, very easy to, to reach. The site is completely devoted to research and research training in social sciences and humanities with different universities and uh, research. Uh, uh, institute present on the site. The campus is equipped, is fully equipped and hosts and meet the requirements of the social, social sciences and humanities research community. <laughs> I listed here uh, some of the facilities that you can find on the campus. The library, which is uh, what is called Grand Equipement Documentaire, which is a huge uh, collection and presents census of uh, social sciences uh, documents. Uh, there is a conference center, a researcher residence, uh, and of course, the restaurant areas and lots of student apartments are available for visiting students or local students. Now coming to, to ELF, which is the National Best Cohort, mainly three, three goals, but one which is the first, which is obvious, just uh, study from pre-birth to adulthood, the environment that affects child development, health and socializations. So really classical uh, etiological research. But also we have uh, some um, objectives that are try to meet the public demand. And so we produce some reports for the Ministry of Health on different topics that are worth of interest, for example, time spent with the children on screens, and also to provide biological samples from the perinatal component of the first French national biomonitoring program. That was all the things that we did during, after, just after women delivered the children. For the two, these two objectives, the representativeness is of course required. And uh, of course, we have all sets of ways to treat the data. The protocol of inclusion uh, in the court included the single birth or twin infants uh, that were 
more than 30 weeks of gestation. Women had to be 17 years old, able to sign formal consent. And the family planned to live in France for at least three, three years so that we can follow them. In fact, there was at the same time a study, a cohort study, run with premature newborns, and which is called EPPH2, and which whom, which whom we, we have uh, different studies, common studies going on. Here you have uh, the location of the different maternities that we sampled, 349 of them, all over in France. During 25 selected days in 2011, on four periods. And there were two, more than 200 maternities selected uh, all over in France. We recruited uh, more than 18,000 newborns, and uh, there were almost 300 twin pairs. The acceptance, acceptation rates, once uh, the, the mother accepted to participate, I mean, the acceptation, accept, acceptation rate was 51%. But basic information um, were, were recorded for all eligible births. And we had a subgroup of biological sample for 3,000 mothers. Here, there is uh, the, the different uh, steps of the follow-up. Uh, we can see that we followed the, the court uh, through telephone interviews, personal interviews, and uh, we have also some linkage with the data of the National Health Insurance, some environment surveillance databases, and some geographic socioeconomic indicators. Here you have some results of the follow-up. Uh, we just we achieved uh, almost five years ago a five year survey with the children of five years. We collected more than eleven thousand uh, sample of eleven thousand was was interviewed, and we are right now running the 10, 10 year survey with expected. 10,000 children in participating in the study, which includes a face-to-face -face interview with a child and a biological sampling. If you want to have a complete information about the cohort, we published in cohort profile of the Journal of Epi International Journal of Epidemiology um, a core profile of the court, so you have a lot of things uh, about participation, attrition, and so forth uh, in this in this publication. What we plan now is combining ELF and AP page two for the ten years old survey, which is right now starting. But where at when the children are 12, a medical examination with, with a general practitioner um, using the fact that uh, now there is a supposedly mandatory exam for adolescents, uh, which is reimbursed by national health insurance. So we would collect information when this examination is doing. And we plan to, we are preparing a web questionnaire for adolescents.
uh, of course, I, I didn't go very inside the, the contents of the court, but I would say ELF is a really a multidisciplinary uh, cohort which uh, collect data in social, social sciences data, health data, development data, most of them being collected at each wave. So we have a very, very close follow-up of what's going on with the family, with the health, with the development, with the performance of uh, the children at school, how they are kept in daycare at school, and there are some exposures. All these data are available in the database. Nope. Sorry. Just so to get the data, we we think that with the aid of the of the team, data requests will have to be made to the data access committee, which is our structure to to examine all the demand. And we have to go through this procedure to examine all the demand of the data. And this uh, committee will assess the relevance, the feasibility, and the adequacy of the data with plan analysis. Of course, once we somebody is coming to work on the data, this process will be very short because, of course, the feasibility, the adequacy, and uh, would have been checked earlier. The survey data will be made available by the health data management team, and preferably data will have to be treated locally on a SaaS enterprise application that we use internally. We think that given the, given the number of, of investigations, we have a survey in maternity, survey at two months, one year, two years, two years, three years and a half, five years and a half that are available. The large size and complexity of database, uh, it seems reasonable to consider a three week stay, 15 days of work. We think that one week stay wouldn't be enough. And we think that stay couldn't, cannot take place uh, during the year 2022. We are all very busy with the ongoing survey and the most favorable period to join the health team would be the fourth quarter of 2023 but of course this is negotiable and earlier would be probably possible okay thank you and uh, sorry for this a bit difficult <laughs> presentation thank you jean louis um we'll move to the final presentation of the institutions um, with Marika de Braune presenting center data. Thank you, Anna. So, uh, thank you and good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Marika de Braune. I'm senior researcher at center data. And I would uh, like to tell you more about center data, uh, the list data archive, and how your visit to us um, would look like. I'm afraid I cannot. Uh, yes, sorry. Okay, so first of all, where can you find us? Center Data is located uh, in the southern Netherlands on the beautiful green campus of Tilburg University. As you can see here, um, we are also well located with good connections to the rest of the Netherlands and the neighboring countries. Uh, Center Data is an independent non-profit research institute. Uh, our mission is to answer research questions in the area of people and society. We collect and analyze and disseminate reliable data for the academic community. Uh, for the government and the private sector. 
in order to support and contribute to scientific, and social and policy relevant research. And in total, our team consists of about 50 employees from various professional backgrounds. We have experts in uh, survey research, uh, software development, policy research, data science, experimental research and more. And this means that we have a broad uh, knowledge base in-house of different areas of expertise. Here you can see a few examples. We specialize in data collection and surveys, um, data infrastructures and software for scientific research, but also in fields like forecasting model, models and machine learning. Now, one of our main data infrastructures and um, services for researchers is the LIST data archive. LIST stands for Longitudinal Internet Studies for the Social Sciences. Uh, the data archive uh, provides you data from the LIST panel that was established in 2007 for scientific, social and policy relevant research and it comprises about uh, 7,500 individuals. And by now, we have already more than 250 studies and even more data sets available from various disciplines. But now I would like to give the word to our uh, director, Marcel Das, and the list coordinator, Joris Mulder, who will tell you more about the data archi archive. High quality data are invaluable for excellent research. The LIST Data Archive offers an extensive collection of studies to use for scientific research. The archive includes data collected in the LIST panel, a probability-based online panel in the Netherlands, managed by Research Institute Center Data. Every month, panel members fill out online surveys. A key component of the panel is the LIST Core Study, which covers topics such as health, social values and economic situation. Researchers are furthermore welcome to conduct their own surveys and experiments in the panel on various topics. Via the LIST Data Archive, all these studies are made available to researchers around the world. How to access the data? The LIST data are available free of charge for scientific purposes. On the archive's website, you can directly view information about the studies, the questions and variables. To download the data files, you need to register. This is easy, just fill out a user statement online. Center Data will then provide you with a login by email. After logging in, you can either download your selected data set or create a new basket by combining variables from different studies. All data can be merged together using a unique respondent identifier to answer your specific research question. Greater impact for your research. At Center Data, we strive to make the list data fair. This stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Each data set has its own DOI, making it citable and easy to find. Publications based on list data are linked to the related data sets. This way, we support the whole data lifecycle and enhance the impact of your research output. The archive has been awarded the Core Trust seal as a trustworthy data repository. The LIST Data Archive is created by the research community for the research community. Come join other researchers at listdata.nl. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed the video. Here you can um, still see some examples of the topics that are covered uh, by the list studies that are available. Uh, you can find data on health and well-being, family relations, social integration and leisure, schooling, retrospective childhood, time use, um, life history, parenthood, and also recent studies on the corona pandemic to name just a few examples. 
So finally, what would your visit um, to center data look like in practice? Well, as said earlier, um, already our office is located on the campus of Tilburg University, and we have a good connection uh, by public transport to the city center of uh, Tilburg. And we are located in uh, modern offices with a casual and friendly atmosphere. And we are planning to host about three to four guest researchers at the same time. And when you stay at us, um, we will provide you with an introduction program on the list data, uh, but also insights on how the data are collected and how to get the most out of the data archive. And based on your needs, we can also provide um, custom support on handling the data and analysis uh, techniques. And we will, of course, connect you with center data colleagues based on relevant expertises and research interests. So on behalf of our entire team, I would like to wish you welcome to visit Center Data. We are waiting to get to know you, to answer your questions, exchange research ideas, and collaborate on research initiatives. Thank you very much. And back to you, Anna. Thank you, Marika, and thanks again to all the speakers. For more information, visit www.coordinate-network.eu.